Let's turn our Bibles uh, once again to Romans chapter 4. We're looking at, uh, we started last Sunday the discussion that uh, we became the children of Abraham. Verse 1, What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, has found? For if Abraham was justified by works, <clears throat> he has something to boast about, but not before God, for what, for, for what does the scripture says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works his wage is not credited as a favor, but as what is due. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing on the man to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven and whose sins have been covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. Is this a blessing then on the circumcised or on the uncircumcised? Also for we say, faith was created to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it created while he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which had while uncircumcised, so that he might be the father of all who believe without being circumcised, that righteousness might be created to them and the father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, but also follow in the steps of the faith of our father Abraham, which he had while uncircumcised. For the promise to Abraham or to his descendants that he would be heir of the world was not through the law, but through righteousness of faith. For if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void and the promise nullified. For the law brings about wrath, but where there is no law, there also is no violation. For this reason, it is by faith in order that it may, may be in accordance with grace, so that the promise will be guaranteed to all the descendants, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all, as it is written, a father of many nations have I made you. In the presence of him whom, whom he believed, even God, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence that which does not exist, <clears throat> in hope against hope he believed, so that he might become a father of many nations. According to that which has been spoken, so shall your descendants be. Without becoming weak in faith, he contemplated his own body, now as good as dead since he was about 100 years old. And the deadness of Sarah's womb, yet with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God. And being fully assured that what God has promised, he was also able to perform. Therefore, it was also credited to him as righteousness. Now, not, in, not for his sake only, was it written that it was created to him, but for our sake also, to whom it will be created, as those who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He who has, was delivered over because of our transgressions and was raised because of our justification. That was actually a, uh, a formal writing of Paul on how we should be tracing our spiritual ancestry. And we emphasized that that verse that says, calling those things that are not as though they were, although people have largely applied it to money, to properties, the application is actually on having a child. Because uh, 
Abraham was 99 years old. Sarah was around 90. So they were both dead. And this is the critical importance of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The Bible says, without the resurrection, our faith is in vain. And so what is being pointed out there is, if you can believe in the resurrection or that Jesus raised from the dead, you will be saved. You know, today there are people who discount that you don't have to believe in the resurrection. That is central to our faith. Without seeing it. Because without faith in the resurrection, we cannot believe that Jesus rose from the dead. And we cannot also believe that God can raise us back to life. It is center. And I made an application that uh, when we talk about Abraham, walking in the faith of Abraham, is actually believing in what God has promised. You know, what, what is faith? Simply believe, uh, define it as faith is believing. You can come up with all kinds of definitions. If, if you can believe what God had promised. And this is, this is uh, where our human reasoning and judgment comes into play. For example, God told Abraham, you will be the father of many nations. Can he believe that? Well, perhaps when he was 65 years old, he can believe that because he's still a little bit strong. But then the moment you turn 70, can you really believe that? And so Sarah, Sarah was just like all of us, striving to believe God for something. But then like Sarah and Abraham, there comes a point, especially Sarah, there comes a point, it becomes very discouraging. You know, if you, are, if you are believing God to be healed, for example, and you're dying every day, your faith will be challenged. And so Abraham, or Sarah, saw her body die. The promise we can assume was given. She was expecting to have children before menopause. Then, then you know, you start getting a little older and a little older until she felt it. She was dying inside. Well, how can you, how can, how can you be, believe God for, for a child when you're dried up inside? You see, as I said before, it is easier to believe God for healing than to believe God for resurrection. If, if you cannot believe God to heal you of colds, how can you believe God to heal you of... Uh, how can you raise somebody from the dead? And so Sarah felt it. He dried up. She dried up. And so what she did was gave Hagar to, uh, to Abraham. That was a big challenge. But God says, but my promise to you, Abraham, is through uh, Sarah. And Abraham looked at that. He, he, the Bible says he contemplated in his body. He said, well, I'm old. I'm 99 years old. And Sarah is old. And uh, she's way past menopause. Now that is an impossible situation. But then he looked to God and said, yeah, but you promised. And that is hope against hope. Meaning, as, as far as the human level is concerned, you're hopeless. And this is where, where the power of faith comes into play. Because a lot of people find themselves in a hopeless situation as far as human level of thinking is concerned. Now, our problem is this. The moment we come to a point of hopelessness, that is when we start doing something about the situation. Or when we are anticipating that we are becoming hopeless, that is when we started, start using our own actions. You know, you... You, be, you believe God for a godly husband or a godly wife. But then you're getting old. What are you going to do about it? You know, so I have seen this. Some uh, Christian men started going to the way of the world. And he started saying, well, I'm going to, I can't find any woman that I like in the church. Or I don't like their style. I'm going to go to the world. That's adding human effort. And then we, we call it truth. We call it theology. We begin to make excuses. We begin to say, well, you know, God used it to get the person born again. You're not discounting that, but still you use your human effort. You see. And some people, they started, now this is both men and women. Uh, some, some women started dressing up to be seductive. 
in, in the truest term of the uh, uh, meaning of the word. What happened? You, you, a person can start feeling hopeless like Abraham and Sarah and start doing something about it. And that is really where, where the critical point of faith is. Can you believe that God can raise somebody from the dead? And so, <clears throat> David, David understood that. Uh, the apostles understood that. And pay, but finally, Abraham under, understood, of course, that he was willing to offer Isaac. But uh, that, was, that was a big challenge on the part of, of uh, Abraham. And I'm, I'm thinking about that. It is the same for us. You know. Think about it. When was the promise of the Messiah made? Hmm? It's a thousand years ago. In the Garden of Eden. Right after Adam and Eve fell. Right? The seed of the woman will crush the head of the seed of the serpent. That was thousands of years ago. There were no Jews and Gentiles, just mankind. And, and that was made. It was made to whom? Adam, right? Dalawa lang sila, kayo mahula, di ba? Dalawa lang tao nung araw, Adam and Eve lang. So, so, it was made to Adam and Eve, right? What happened to Adam and Eve? Did they see it fulfilled? Also, what happened to them? They died. You know, they died without receiving the promise. But can they believe it? And, and essentially, if we are going to uh, use our faith today in our human level, in our current situation, in spite of sometimes our situation looks hopeless, can we, can we use our faith? Because we start judging, ah, wala na akong pag-asa. I'll, I'll just use whatever I, I can. I'll do whatever I can. You know, but you have to remember, Hebrews 11, some people died without receiving the promise while believing the promise. While believing the promise. And this is, this is where people have difficulty struggling in their faith. And so now, this is the kind of faith that uh, Abraham, uh, Paul says, we have to walk in the footsteps of Abraham. When you can believe God for something that's already dead to come back to life. And so, this becomes a critical issue in who are the children of Abraham then? You see? The, the Calvinist, John Calvin, believe in, in uh, they call it the uh, replacement theology. That the nation of Israel was replaced by the church. Where well, you will not find in the scriptures, but so, that's what they believe. But actually the reason why Calvin was, was doing that is because he failed to understand the difference between the children of Abraham and the nation of Israel. Okay? There is the natural Israel and that there is the children of Abraham. The children of Abraham, according to the scriptures, are the children of promise. They are of faith. So why, why of faith? Well, because you have to have faith at the age of Abraham and Sarah to have a child. It was promised, but... When he believed, that, that is when it was credited to him as righteousness. And so this, this becomes a struggle. And later we will discuss some of our false assumptions. Because sometimes we assume simply because somebody is, is super blessed or extravagantly blessed that they are approved by God. You know, there is a theory, there is a philosophical theory that, that uh, right, uh, might is right. You know, when somebody is strong... It's like, have you noticed when, when you guys are arguing? I don't know if it's true with you in your house. But in my house, when, when people argue, they think that by raising their voice, they become right. Huh? Decibel means right. Is, are, are you correct? Yes, I'm right. Okay, okay, you're right. Well, because you raise your voice doesn't mean you're right. Diba? A, uh, a parent can look can look at the child and say, I'm going to withdraw your allowance. I'm not going to buy you new clothes. And so the child agreed. Okay, mom, okay, that you're right. Well, not because you have the, the might that doesn't make you right. But that is, that is generally accepted today. That's why even if somebody, look at what's happening even in this country. 
Some people hold some rally, some protest. Even if they're wrong, even if they're the minority, it becomes right because of the voice. That is one of the, that is a false teaching that, that is going on around. But, but the issue really is, is whether we have the faith to continue believing God even, even if uh, it doesn't, it, it looks dead, or even if it's dead. If you can call things that are not as though they were. This was, this was a big challenge. Uh, the law also, when, when it was given, when the promise was given to Abraham, it was, it was before the law. Now, remember this also. Abraham was a Gentile. People forget that. Well, technically, he was not a Gentile. There were no Gentiles. Why? There were no Jews. Just mankind. There was none. So, so if people argue, well, Abraham is a Jew. He was not. He died just as a man. There were no Jewish race yet, you see. Chosen people, he started, of course, with, with, uh, with Abraham, and then came Isaac, and then came Jacob, the nation of Israel. But uh, they were called Jews because of the tribe of Judah. But that, that's way before the law. Abraham was already chosen. And the promise was given before there was a nation of Israel. And so the Bible says in, in Genesis, to, to you all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Say all nations. That includes the Philippines, even before we became a nation. All nations of the earth will be blessed. How will they be blessed? By walking in the footsteps of Abraham. That is faith. Before the nation of Israel was even born. And so you can, you can make an argument that it is really the children of Abraham who is by faith, who, who walks in the area of faith. So Abraham now is the father of faith he is the father of us all who believe. It's the agency of faith that made it possible for anybody to become part of the household of faith, not because of works. Abraham became an earthly father because of faith. His productive years were, were gone. And the, the faith of Abraham also hoped against hope. Again, this, this is the most difficult thing. Uh, too often, for example, uh, if we encounter each other for the first time, let's say you come to this church, you're a Christian, and you want to be impressive. This is how we live, okay? Or you met somebody, forget the church, just you met somebody. You want to be impressive. What are you going to do? You're going to tell stories about yourself, and you are going to tell that person about your dreams. You know, I don't know how many people come here and say, oh, pastors, I see visions about Lion's Heart. They, they tell me that. I saw this. Oh, we're going to do this. Well, that, that is good. I mean, maybe I'm, I, I will feel excited or show excitement, but I, I learn how to temper myself when people talk to me like that. Oh, you know, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. Well, it's that faith. If that is the faith, can you sustain that? You see? It's, it's just like when, when you start dating somebody and you tell the person that you're dating, you know, when we get married, we're going to be doing the following things. Well, that is before you get married. But then you progress in years and you begin to say, well, for, forget that. You know, forget that. That's why a lot of married couples, a lot of their dreams, they're already shelved. You know, before you get married, you say, we're going to start a business. We're going to do the following things. So, so they have their first child, and then they have the second child. Or they have the, and then all the dreams were shelved. Well, what happened to your dreams? Huh? Okay na lang. Mali, maligaya na naman kami. You know? So, so what happened? All is for impression. And and we begin to become individuals who are habitually just making impressions. Even if there are no accomplishments, we just want to make impressions. Because Im impressions are just like that. And, and we, we remember that. You know, yesterday in, in Sports Channel, I've, I don't know what, what school was this in, in uh, college. The guy threw up. 
quarterback through a Hail Mary and uh, catch the ball at the end zone, caught the ball at the end zone, and they won the game. And the commentator says, that guy just made a play that will be immortalized and he will remember and be remembered with for the rest of his life. You know that is a true and a sad statement. Can you imagine people ask you, I heard, I'm the one who caught the Hail Mary pass 30 years ago in high school. We won. Can you imagine that's all you can say? You know, and, and one of the plays that was shown was somebody in high school, basketball, he, he made a shot way be, before the half court. I mean, it was, a, it was a last second shot. And again, he will be remembered for, the, for that shot for the rest of his life. Can you imagine if you, are, if you will be remembered for that, for the rest of your life, and that's it? So what about the other dreams? A lot of us shelve and table or, or bury our dreams. And this is where the faith of Abraham is. Can you, even if you are old, or even if your body is dead, can you still believe God? Because he promised. You know what righteousness to God is? Righteousness is if God can promise something and you can believe that. Can you believe that even if it's impossible on the outside? That's what pleases God the most. Because the Bible says, he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. That is in, in uh, Romans chapter, uh, uh, Hebrews chapter, chapter uh, 11. Yeah. You must believe that he is, and he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. That is a faith. Can you believe? If you believe God promised you something, can you believe God for that? And so the question now is, what are the promises that you believe God made to you before? Can you believe that? Can you pray and say, Lord, I believe that promise that you made me years ago. But a lot of, a lot of people, they, we go into this impressing others, other things. God told me this. God told me this. God told me. And then they forget about this. They just forget about that. You know? I, I told you one of the uh, board members that I have in the Philippines when we started, we were just meeting in a hotel, and, and, and we talked, what we're going to do, I said, I think what we're going to be doing in the next 50 years in the Philippines, I said, this was 20 years ago, I said, it's where we're going to lay a foundation for the next generation. You know, maybe it, it doesn't sound very ambitious, but, but uh, we began to see the deterioration of the teaching of the Word of God. So we said, we're going to bring it back, I said. And, and we, we agreed some of the teachings of our faith fathers will, will keep it alive. And so we say, it's, I, I said, it's going to be around 50 years. One of them said, well, maybe, maybe in around 20 years we'll turn it around. Well, it's been over 20 years, so we have not been able to turn it around. But I said, 50, I just, I just th thought that the laying of the foundation will be very long. You know, not, not everybody who were with us back then are with us anymore. Well, if, if God told us all that that is the case, that I'm talking about the Philippines, then why is it that not all are there already still? Because believing God for what he promised to you, even if it looks hopeless, is the most critical point of faith. Can you keep holding, can you keep believing, even if it really looks impossible? You know, because when we say, well, it's impossible. Okay, tama na. That's it. I, I don't know who is that boxer. They made a movie out of it. Uh, the guy who, in a car accident, he almost got paralyzed. And, and he started training back in the basement of his house until he regained championship. I, I watched that movie. It's very inspirational. Because if, if you are a boxer, and you, you are in a major car accident and you almost cannot walk and be able to nurse yourself back into health and become a champion, that's bringing somebody back to life who was already dead. And that is, that is where our faith is. Now, now remember now what you believe God told you when you first got born again or when you first received a promise from God. What is that? It could be a career. 
you know, God wants me to, you know, from time to time I, I still ask Joseph, well, well I, I, I thought you wanted to be a billionaire. I just, I just don't give up on these things too easily. You know, I may not follow. I just don't give up on it easily because Joseph has a dream before that he will be a billionaire. Oh, I like that dream, you know. Can you imagine if, if, if he becomes a billionaire and he tithes? I don't need to raise money for our building in the Philippines. I'll buy, I'll buy 10 of them. And so I, I asked, I, I thought he was going to go for, for a degree in economics or accounting. I told him, if you're going to be a businessman, I said, take a degree in accounting or, uh, or economics. And, and I think he asked me, what about business administration? I said, forget that. You learn business in business. I said, get accounting or economics. Well, he, he, he turned out getting mechanical engineering. So I said, well, okay. Why? Because Lee Ayakoka was uh, from Chrysler was a mechanical engineer. So I said, there's still hope, you know, because Lee Ayakoka was a mechanical engineer. But then you study Lee Ayakoka, he said, well, money is not in development engineering. He said, money is in sales. So Lee Ayakoka moved into sales. He said, instead of making cars, I'll, I'll sell cars. There's money there. And he became a very successful CEO and, and became filthy rich. I said, this. And then he joined. He, 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 well, he is in the military. I said, whoa, that's in the natural, that's hopeless. <laughs> you know. But then the, the, the thing is this, can you, can you believe God that in whatever, whatever situation you are in, God can fulfill his promise? That is, that is where faith becomes very valuable. Can, because we really look at our situations and we say, it is hopeless. Well, can you bring it back to life? And that is, that is a, where, 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 the, where the critical issue is. And he becomes the father of our faith. Abraham uses faith, strictly speaking, not to enrich himself. Yeah? I know that this is the most application of faith. Remember when, when, he, when he delivered Lot from his enemies? And the king says, okay, take all the, just get our men. And said, no, I'm not going to get anything from, from, from any of you. He said, I don't want any man to say that I made Abraham rich. Why? Because God has been prospering him. But if you look at the scriptures, the one that Abraham, there are two things that Abraham was really believing God for. What's the number one? If you can remember, what's the number one thing that he was believing God for? A son. A <laughs> son. A son, Isaac. What's number two? A city. Now, the son he was able to see, did he see the city? He did not. He just saw it in a vision, perhaps, but he lived in tents. The guy in today's term will be a billionaire. He never even built a house because God showed him a city whose maker and builder is God. You know what that city is? That's the new Jerusalem. It was promised to him by God. And so he could not get himself to build a city made out of hands, you see, human hands. Well, had he applied that same principle to, uh, to Isaac, he would not have slept with Hagar and would not have the problem of Ishmael today. But he, he made a mistake there, you see. That is where faith is. Can you call those things that are not as though they were? And and the faith of Abraham hoped against hope. And, and if, we cannot, if we cannot see it clearly like that, then our faith is being misused. You know? We really had to start, because come to think about it, everything that we have today, we will, we will not bring any of them to heaven. And what we need is to be able to use our faith the way God wants us to have. And so the children of promise now, the children of Abraham, are those who comes out of faith. And that is our identity. You know? The true identity is the identity of faith. The faith of Abraham begin to look at the nations of the earth and begin to see children from all over the place. 
because the nations of the world will be blessed through you. Now notice also that uh, Sarah was not called the mother of faith. Abraham is called the father of faith, but Sarah was not called the mother of faith. Why? She gave Hagar to Abraham. She, she could not wait. She could not wait anymore. Now this is where, where the mercy of God comes in. Because, because remember that, that uh, of course, Ishmael grew older, <clears throat> and then Isaac was born. And the Bible says that he was sporting with, uh, actually, he was mocking, he was mo mocking Isaac. And uh, Hagar's, uh, Sarah saw that. Well, before he used, she used Hagar. Now, just, just read the story plainly. Here's this slave. She told the slave, Hagar, you're my slave. I'll give you to my, to my, uh, to my husband. Now, the custom of that day is this. If, if I am the, the mistress and, and if I'm the master of the house and I, took, and I took the maid of my wife because she could not have a child, the child that I have with the maid is our child, not the maid's child. Example of that is the wives of Jacob. All of them are children of Abraham. You know. Some of them are, are of, of uh, the maids of uh, Leah and uh, who's the other one? Ra Rachel. Yeah, but they are all children of Abraham. They all receive inheritance. Now that, that's the thing that you have to consider. Uh, Ishmael did not receive inheritance, but all of the children of Abraham received inheritance. Some of them, well, most of them, came from the servants. That's the same situation of uh, of uh, Hagar. Well, Ishmael grew up and they were mocking, mocking uh, Isaac and Sarah felt mocked and she went to Abraham and says, Husband, throw her out along with the child. And Abraham said, What? You gave her to me. And our custom and the tradition of the people is, he is my son. Now get rid of him. And Abraham, they, they had a fight. You can, you can see it from the scriptures. Well, you, cannot, you cannot do that. And Abraham was meditating. You know what God says? Listen to your wife Sarah. That puzzles me. Why would God say that to Abraham? And Hagar and Ishmael were sent out. With nothing, the Bible says, a jug of water, perhaps a sandwich or something. And she could not bear to see Ishmael dying. There are, there are some things in the scriptures that I don't understand still, and that is one of those. But God told Abraham, listen to Sarah. She was never called, though, the mother of faith, because she could not believe that God will bring back to life her womb, which God did. For her womb to be able to carry a child, even if it's not from, uh, well, uh, even if she is old, he has, God has to resurrect her dead womb. She could not believe God for that. It was Abraham who believed God for that. The faith of Abraham also is what we may call as an unwavering faith. How do you know we are walking in the faith of Abraham? It does not waver in the promise of God. Now this, this is the thing now. God says it does not waver, but he slept with Hagar. Well, what that tells me is this. Abraham did not come up with the idea that I will find me another woman, a mistress, that Sarah will give me, which was the custom of the day. Never crossed mine until Sarah came and says, well, you know, Abraham, I could not keep believing God with you that we will have a child. I'm dead. I'm menopause. Can't you see? So sleep with Hagar. Abraham did not come up with that idea. His faith was unwavering in that sense. How do you know if your faith is wavering now? If you are doing your best to help God. Yeah. If you are doing your best to help God. I, 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 told, you, I told you this a, a few times. Uh, when I started believing God for a wife, there are certain things that I know has to be a qualification of a wife of a minister because God called me to be a minister. Well, I've got a couple of girlfriends before, 
that uh, when we were dating would not meet the qualifications. So what did I do? We were not fighting, really. We just, I just said, well, it's not going to work. I broke up with him. I, I initiated that. You know, normally in, in the Philippines, a man will make the woman angry. I, I don't know here. But if the man doesn't like the woman anymore, he will make her angry. So mad, count on that emotional explosion that she will say, okay, break the tayo. You know? And then the moment she says, okay, sige, break the tayo. Eh, she nagsimula eh, di ba? That's what happened. Well, I didn't do that because why, why would you have to wait? I, I, uh, I initiated a breakup because it doesn't meet what, what I am believing God for and what I believe is the biblical qualifications. My, my wife does, doesn't believe this, but, and, and she doesn't see it even today. I was actually ready to live a life without, in my mind, without a wife. If I'm not going to have a woman that will meet God's qualifications. Why? Because I know it's going to be a disaster. Yeah. People don't think that, but that, that is what I was thinking. Can, can you imagine if, if you are married to a, to a woman or a husband who just fights you every day? You know, and, and, and you are killing each other every day? What's the use of being married? You thought it's heaven. It turned out it's multiple hell. You know? Oh, this is not what I thought it's going to be. And, and people just, just don't think far enough over these things. But I was just thinking about ministry. You know, when, when our, our church started, God gave us the vision, of course, for mission in this church. When, when, when our offering started going down, we're losing members, and... And I was anticipating if that continues, our offering will, will go down. Because you can't stop gossip. You know, to, to this day, I have, I have no Facebook account because I don't know how to handle it. Our church has Facebook. Who handles it? I, I don't handle it. Our web team handles that. I'm just ignorant on, on that area. But, but I, was, I was telling myself, no matter how much you tell the members that uh, gossip destroys friendship, they'll continue to gossip, you know. Now, these are, this, I, 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 I try to copy this from Abraham. Abraham faced the facts. I just have to face the facts. I can't stop you guys from gossiping if you want, you know. That's just a fact. So, but I was looking at the promise of God and the vision that God gave to us. So I told my wife, because the kids are already in school and grown up, I said, Anne, I think I have to go back to work, I said. And, and she was, she, she was, you know, in her, in her oldening age. <laughs> so, uh, and my wife is not angry, afraid to work. And I said, yeah, sure. And I was pushing her, I think you have to, to go back to work just to prepare. Because we already have plans. I, I was coming up with plans on how I will deal with the lowering finance of the church. And I, I, she said, what kind of work do you think I should? I said, I said, go into travel business. Maybe I said, apply to an airline. And she looked at me and said, why airline? I said, because Ann, if we don't have any more money for missions. I said, if you are in the airline business, because I'm, I'm looking here at uh, Juni and, <laughs> and uh, Joseph. I said, they're in the airline industry and free, free. <laughs> Free ticket. I said, Anne, if you are in the airline business, at least I have free tickets. I can fly to the Philippines and teach. I said, I'll, I'll worry later about, about the finances. But I said, I can fly. That's all I was thinking. Even in that, I still believe in the vision of the house. And my wife says, yeah, well, there, there's, somebody was offering her actually. And she said, but, but I'm going to have to travel. And the location where she was being offered is not in Illinois, but traveling distance. She said, I'm going to have to relocate, perhaps. And then she looked at me and says, you know what, sweetheart? God can provide for your airfare ticket. I really believe that. We'll make money. That's it. Now, can you imagine if, if my wife is a weakling? You know. Oh, sweetheart, we're, we're losing members. Maybe you should retire and some, some, some wives are like that. 
I sent a pastor in one province in the Philippines, and there was a problem in the church. And I, I went, because I was the missions director during that time. I went to the church. It was a little far, but I went to the church to, to do an oculus inspection. I was preaching that night. And they have testimony time. You know, that's why sometimes I'm allergic to testimony time. Testimony time, and the wife stood up and started crying in front of the church. And I was about to speak, and I said, what's, what's going on here? And she started crying to the church. And she started attacking the members of the church. Yeah, please, she said, don't, don't, don't do this to my husband. And she was just crying. I said, what happened here? The church got ruined. Yeah. The ch- and the woman is a graduate of Bible school. The church got ruined. And so sometimes people doesn't think about that. But you need to have faith to find your lifetime partner. Because, boy, you, you make a mistake that way. You just, you just think it's heaven. It's going to be hell, you see. And, and this is very critical in the life of faith. And Abraham did not waver. And to walk in the faith of Abraham is how we are expected to believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. As I was saying earlier, that's why the faith in the resurrection is critical. Now, sad to say, there are uh, DePaul University along with, with, with Denver Seminary. Uh, they are in partnership, and, and they came up with this, doc, they, they call it the Jesus Seminar. Five priests, from uh, Franciscan priests from, from, from DePaul, they came up with what they call it the Jesus Seminar. In the Jesus Seminar, you don't have to believe in the virgin birth. You don't have to believe in the resurrection to be a Christian. Well, Paul said, you've got to believe that God raised him from the dead. Right now, it is no longer necessary in some circle. But that is, you have to believe that Jesus raised him from the dead. How do you know your faith is genuine? You really believe that God raised Jesus back to life. Because when you don't, Paul says, what's the use of our faith? We can't also believe that uh, that God can raise us back to life if we are not walking in the faith of Abraham. Listen, is Jesus going to come in my lifetime? Is Jesus going to return in your lifetime? I would like to believe yes because of, of the signs. By the way, in the prophecies, some, some, another prophecy is just about to be fulfilled. Right before our eyes, you should be following this. You know, the, the Trump, I, I, I know some, the, the guy really just some, sometimes just opened his mouth too soon. He, uh, he said he's withdrawing the forces, American forces from Syria. Now you may just, whoa, American forces are going, yeah, but look at it from a prophetic perspective. One of the prophecies is a country from the far north will come at the, at the doors of Israel and will be looking at this nation that they look like a victim, a prey. That's Russia from the far north. Russia has now bases in Syria. And the only force that is stopping it is the U.S. And now that Trump announced, you know what? That prophecy from the far north at the doors of Israel is there. It's another fulfillment of the prophecy that you have to look at. And so we would like to believe Jesus will be coming back in our time. But listen, that is what the apostles believed. What happened to the apostles? They died. That is what each generation of Christians believed. They died. So there is a possibility that we could die without seeing Jesus come back in our time. So now if we die, what happened? We need to have faith that God can bring us back to life. Otherwise, our faith is in vain. Why? Because the Bible says it's hinged on the resurrection. The Bible says that New Jerusalem will be coming down to earth and we will be occupying it and we'll be ruling the nations, ruling with him. Well, if, if, we're, gonna be, if we're not going to be raised back to life, what's the use of our faith? Then we might as well be Jehovah's Witnesses. The Jehovah's Witnesses believe that heaven and hell is just... Now, if you have a good life, that's heaven. If you have a bad life, that's hell. It's now. What's the use? I mean, the Buddhists will have a better doctrine. 
Why? Because they believe in reincarnation. <laughs> but we have to believe really in that. You have to believe in the promise of God. If you cannot believe what, what God is looking for, our people, that when he says something, we grab it and say, Lord, I believe. I just believe this. And, and there is a, a firm conviction in your heart. And you don't waver in that. Now, I'm not saying there are no discouragements. There are discouragements, but you just don't waver. You hold on to it. And so the children of, the children of Abraham are the children of promise. Now, <clears throat> I understand as I, as I teach this, that we are... Uh, we are uh, celebrating <clears throat> December 25, the birth of the Messiah. Was Jesus born on December 25? No way. No. Um, early scholars believe he's probably born around September. But now, <clears throat> new research are showing most probably not September, but March. You know, I prefer March. So we'll have the same birth month, you know. But... Uh, uh, but, but now they're saying around March is, a, is a problem. But you know, that's the material. What we are celebrating is the birth of the Messiah. That is one of the biggest celebrations in Christendom. But according to Paul, the biggest celebration should be the resurrection. That's key to our faith. Now let's go to Romans chapter 9. <clears throat> Starting on verse 6. <clears throat> but it is not as though the word of God has failed. Now, now, these are the words of Paul. And this is why the Jews even today don't like Paul. You know, because of his teachings. But it is not as though the word of God has failed. For they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. <laughs> Look at this. That's why... If, if you are Jewish, you will not like Paul. Because he said, not all who descended, not all of Israel who are descended from Israel, nor are they all children because they are Abraham's descendants. Is that because you're Abraham's descendants means you're his child? That's what Paul is saying. But through Isaac, your descendants will be named. It's not through Ishmael, but through Isaac. Isn't that amazing that the, the, the Muslim world is tracing their, their father as Abraham? Paul said no. Through Isaac, not through Ishmael. Okay? The, the Muslims will never like that either, you see? Now the Jews will not like that and the Muslims will not like that. That is, it is not the children of the flesh who are children of God, but children of, but the but the children of promise are regarded as descendants. For this is the word of promise. At this time, I will come and Sarah shall have a son. Now, that will really make a lot of people angry. The verse discusses why the promise to Abraham is still in force today. And it identifies who the children, who the true children of Abraham is. Now, considering the failures of so many generations whom God called, we need, we need to answer a couple of questions, okay? Now, understand, as I ask these questions, I was thinking about this, how many generations have failed? Like, I'll tell you, uh, after the greatest generations, the baby boomers had pushed America out of the knowledge of God. We have, we have generations that just keeps failing. You can see it in families also. One family will be very successful, next generation failed. Now, having said, said that, let me ask this question. Number one, is God that powerful? Or is God powerful enough to right the wrongs of human experience? I mean, did, did you guys ever make a mistake? Okay. Some of our mistakes are small. Some of our mistakes are big, right? 
Now, the question is this. Can God write that wrong? Huh? That's, that's a big question. Can God write that wrong? That's critical to us. Because if you believe God can raise back somebody from the dead, now listen, if God can write any wrong, huh? we're, we're home free. That means whatever wrong, now remember, in our minds we cannot write the wrongs. In fact, some of us still feel condemned over the wrongs we have done before. We could not, we could not move forward. Like, why, why, don't you, why don't you apply for a job? Ah, I have applied for 10 jobs and I'm always being rejected. I'm, I'm no good. I'm, I'm, I'm no good. I, I just cannot. Well, the question is, can God right all wrong? Now, the second question is this. If God can, if God can right all wrong, <clears throat> is God willing to right these wrongs? Well, it's one thing for God to have the ability to make wrongs right. But is he willing? Yeah. Is he willing? For example, if you are, if you are a... Uh, I, I, Joseph is, is graduating this, this summer. He was very happy because he said, 15 more weeks in his last semester. He was already asked to apply for... In ten, in, how do you call it? Intention to graduate. Uh, and then he said, Papa, one more semester. Well, actually, can he, say for example, Joseph failed. And instead of taking five years in engineering, it would take him ten years or eight years. Or let's just say six years. He made a mistake. He fooled around. <clears throat> made a lot of wrong decisions, and I was expecting he will graduate on the fifth year. He thought he was going to be graduating in three years, but I said, no, engineering, five years. He said, no, no, Papa, five years. Mama finished hers three and a half. I'll finish mine <clears throat> three years. I said, well, Mama is economics. It has less math, I said, and less of this science things, and it's a four-year course. I said, engineering is a five-year course. He said, oh, two years. I said, five years. Well, what, what if he made a mistake? Party all night, you know, he sleep all day, he snore in the class. Pastor Gina told me that when he was in Champaign, Illinois, <clears throat> he said, he knows this. He said, a lot of us don't go to classes. Yeah. He said, our parents are not around. And he said, there's a community college in Champaign that if Champagne, Illinois kicks you out, <clears throat> you will be asked to stay there and prove yourself. And he told me, some students, what they do is, they never tell their parents. They just simply tell their parents that they're still in Champaign, Illinois, you know. <laughs> what they never told their parents is they're, what they're doing there is just drinking champagne, you know. They're no longer in school. But Pastor Gene told me these things. He said, some people just get kicked out even at the community college. You know, and, and they never told their parents. Sometimes, they will lie to their parents. They blame the teachers. So my teachers are bad. They, they just blame everybody. Have you noticed that everybody's being blamed? They, they never take responsibilities. Well, the parents found out, for example. The kids made a lot of mistakes. Now what if you are rich and you told the kid, I will, I, I can help you, I can help you still go back to school. You see? But are you willing to do that? It's a totally different thing. If I am able, for example, if Joseph said, I am, I'm not going to finish my school in five years, I'm, I failed, it's going to be seven years. Well, seven years is to right the wrongs, right? Question is, am I willing to help him right the wrong? I told Joseph, I'm not willing. 
I, I told Joseph, this is our contract. After this, you support yourself. Like, you know, he can still right the wrong, but he has to find a job and support himself. Now you apply it to God. Because you're turning to the human level, you apply it to God. Our mistakes are different. It's sin. I mean, sometimes we just wreck our lives. Can God right those wrongs? Yes. But the question is, is he willing? I told you about that dirty old man in Las Vegas. He's got, I saw him in 700 Club. He's got records of, <clears throat> I mean, just lewd and dirty movies and sex things. And he was the one doing it. And he got so depressed, he even believed he was demon possessed. When he went to 700 Club, he brought the, the reels, the tapes. He even believed he's demon possessed because he said, I can look at the most pure thing in the, in, in the world, anything. He said, he said, within 30 seconds, I'll think of sex. And he said, he got so desperate. He got so, uh, he said he believed he was demon possessed. He decided to take his life. But he was saved. God saved him. And he started becoming an evangelist. God was able to right the wrong. And he was willing to do it. Now, personal application. Do we believe that God can right our wrongs? And can we believe that God is willing to right those wrongs? Now, we are using the life of Sarah and Abraham as a backdrop. Abraham, well, Sarah and Abraham made a mistake. There was Hagar. Yeah? Well, God did not say to Abraham, well, listen, you want Hagar? You're not going to have Isaac. You're just going to have Ishmael. You will no longer be the father of faith. You'll just be the father of the Islamic world in the natural. That's it. But God did not give up. He was willing to right the wrong. The promise of God did not become untrue because some are unfaithful. Now, this is where our faith life really comes to the test. And we have seen this too many times. I have seen preachers say, you know what? I'm raising my kids in the fear and knowledge of God. My, my, my kids will, will live pure lives. Who's this guy from California? Uh, Dr. Fred Price. He so believed in raising children in the fear of God. When his daughter was married, brought her to the doctor. This is ridiculous. But brought her to the doctor and, and, and got insisted on a certificate from a, from, from a uh, ob that her daughter was a virgin when she was married. Yeah. Went that far. I have seen preachers like that. But listen. And then this preacher, something happened to their children. So what do they say? Well, you know, our times are different. Whew. Well, you know, maybe that's too much. That's archaic. We let go of the standards. Now, this is the promise of God. Does it become untrue now because some are unfaithful? We have to address. In fact, this the answer to that question is what will determine where we stand. You know, because what, what for example, I backslide. I just so totally lost it, you know. I went crazy and I backslide. What will some of you say? That born again, that is not true. Well, listen, we have a neighboring church here. Big article this week about him. Put his church in, in, in debt because of gambling. So five or six million dollars. Well, does that make the church that he's pastoring untrue? Well, 
it's his fault. But you know, because of that, a lot of people, we don't know how many, a lot of people just backslide. A lot of people just backslide. You know, among, among us born again, man, we have, we have some embarrassing moments in history. We, uh, some of our ministers just fall. And the falling is in adultery. Uh, one head of the big evangelical church in the U.S., the, uh, the head is into uh, pedophilia and got, got disciplined. You look at this and you say, man, this is embarrassing. But you know, the promise of God is still true. The unfaithfulness of some does not make the promise of God untrue. And, and this, this pushes me and this should push us to keep looking unto Jesus because Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. Therefore, even though Sarah gave Hagar to Abraham, even though Abraham is left with Hagar, the promise is still to Sarah in spite of the mistakes. Now that's why us, we receive promises from the Lord and, and we make mistakes. And sometimes say, well, for, forget that promise. One person here left our church, was called to the ministry. And I told him, I said, God still calls you. And he looked at me and says, Pastor, say, am I still called? I said, well, I saw the anointing in your life, you're called. Well, you know, I, I made the mistakes. Am I still really called? I said, that's not up to you. I said, it's up to God. If God calls you, it's not really up to you. Now, this is where faith comes. Can you, can you keep believing God? That, remember Samson? Samson made a mess. Even got, even got his eyes gouged out. And then in a moment of, of uh, repentance, he just simply said, oh, Lord, help me avenge against these Philistines. And in the last moment, God brought back the anointing and the Bible says the number of Philistines he killed that day is more than the people he killed when he can see. The anointing still work. God was able to right the wrong. That is where, where our faith should come in. Huh? Amen? That's, that, that is calling those things that are not as they were. Because the mistakes of our past can paralyze us. I like, I like what uh, Oral Roberts said. <clears throat> he, was, he was asked some, some, by, by uh, somebody at one time about his, his mistakes. And Oral Roberts says, I never make mistakes. And the uh, interviewer says, what, what, what do you mean, Reverend Roberts? You make a lot of mistakes. He says, yeah, I never make mistakes. And so it puzzled the interviewer. So could you please clarify? He said, what I mean is this. He said, I don't wake up every morning planning what mistakes I will be making. He said, when I wake up in the morning, I plan the following good things. I will do this for the kingdom. I will do this for the kingdom. I will do this for the kingdom. He said, during the day, I am not able to do all of those plans. And during the day, I make a lot of mistakes. But I never plan them. And he said this. I never let my past to paralyze me. I simply look to the future determined to do my best. If you allow it, your past is your grave. That's your burial site. That's your tombstone. It, not only paralyze, it, cannot, it cannot only paralyze, it can also kill us. This is where our faith needs to function. It can bring back to life that which is already dead. You look to God and say, Lord, I believe. Can you imagine for generations people fell and they're looking for the Messiah? But there's, there's a group of people that still believe that the Messiah will come. And then Jesus came. And the amazing thing right now is in, in, in Israel, there's a group of Orthodox Jews that really believe the Messiah is going to come. 
even the, they are ready for the rebuilding of the temple. That is faith when, when you can believe God, God can do, do what he promised thousands of years ago. And that is what our faith should be used. And, and, and I look at Abraham, there is never a passage in the scriptures that Abraham believed God to be wealthy. God made him rich. But his faith was not focused on that. His faith was focused on resurrection. His faith was focused on God will fulfill his promise. And so, and so I think the birth of the Messiah, 4,000 years promise finally came to pass. 4,000 years after the promise was made around 4,000 years before he was born. 4,000 years. People died, generations died, and then Jesus came. And so I look at that. When, when we celebrate Christmas like this, I think we should be looking at what did God promise to us? Or what did God promise to you? Are you still holding on to it? Or did it already die? Can God right your wrongs? Can you believe God that he can right your wrongs? And that is where faith is. Amen.